I know about half the people that I've seen here. So the other half, uh, I'm a stock market analyst, which means I, I absolutely contribute nothing to society. Um, I'm a knowledge worker. I help institutional investors, so the guys who manage your 401ks, pension money, I help them make smarter decisions about stocks. I'm really good at stocks, really suck at everything else, um, especially making presentations. So I, I've never made a presentation that had any pictures or graphs or charts because I don't comprehend them. I'm not visual, I can't figure it out. Um, Martin started out telling us that you were gonna have a takeaway from each, each of the pr presentations today. Um, my takeaway from Martin's intro was that he likes Michael Denny better than he likes me. Um, my takeaway from Michael's presentation is that Hip Hop Gamer really likes Morpheus, which is kind of cool. You guys, you don't know who Hip Hop Gamer is. He was there. Um, Kevin told me that Halo DLC is gonna be free. That's really cool. Um, Alf told me that Amazon is a charity. They're giving stuff away for free as well. That's pretty cool. And Maria told us that community matters, which is kind of cool. I mean, we all knew that. She said it's really obvious, but it obviously wasn't that obvious to DICE until more recently, so that's cool. There's a theme here, which is that if you give people more content or allow them to spend more time accessing content for less money, they're gonna be happy. And, and getting more from less effort, I'd say, is pretty much the definition of productivity. So you wanna be more productive. If you're more productive, you, you're gonna generate more wealth, period. And I, and I think Alf asked the question about that, you know, how many people are, are trying to make engaging games versus trying to monetize? They're one and the same. I mean, if you get people playing your games, you're gonna make more money. You, you just are, unless you're an idiot and you don't know how to monetize. You know, even Mozilla makes money from Firefox by letting Google advertise there. So um, I'm gonna talk about where the industry is going. Um, I'm glad we have these giant monitors, this is awesome. Um, Pretty much everybody here is somehow in the software business. They're, they're in the business of delivering content to consumers. Um, Sony you know, would love to sell as many devices as possible, but they can't do it without content. Um, software sales, it's a big deal. And you know, notwithstanding ALF's numbers on mobile, uh, overall software consumption is huge. It was 22 billion in 2008. Um, and digital was only three billion. I don't know what digital really is. Uh, there's addressable markets, and I'm talking about North America and the PAL territories, not talking about Asia, because Asia's kind of hard to crack for most people. Um, but it was 22 and three total in, in 2008. In 2014, packaged goods dropped like a stone, uh, just under nine billion, and digital was at 17. So the market really was pretty flat in those six years but you see digital taking over. And digital is a lot of things. You know, again, Alf asked about mobile. Um, digital is a combination of mobile, tablet, desktop, free to play. You know, we have some guys here from Wargaming. It's kind of hard to play Wargaming on your Android phone. You know, play World of Tanks on your Android phone. Um, so the market stayed pretty much the same, but digital became the big deal. And consumption has changed a lot as we've migrated to that. Um, lower pricing has kept sales very high, you've gotten more people involved on a greater number of devices. And again, I'm just going where we were and then where we're going. Um, we have 1.4 billion phones and tablets sold annually, two and a half billion PCs uh, attached to the internet in the world, so lots and lots of people. Compare that to 270 million consoles, doesn't even come close. So you all know that the console gamer will spend hundreds of dollars a year on games. You all also know that some mobile gamers, 1%, will spend hundreds of dollars a year on games, uh, but not 100%. So that's back to Alf's speech that let's monetize 100%. You're never gonna get hundreds of dollars unless we can figure out how to leave that game on all the time and, and Amazon just pays you hundreds of dollars a year. Um, you've had a resurgence of gaming on, on the PC, free to play. Uh, League of Legends, Hearthstone are, are kind of the, the games that have started to really show the possibilities of World, World of Tanks, of course. Um, package software has gone from 50 to 60 over the last decade. That's good, so you know, get a little bit more money. Um, you've got DLC that until Halo decided to give it away, people charge for DLC, so you could monetize 100, 120 bucks out of a player. Um, we're getting a lot of distribution. You've got Google Play, iTunes stores, obviously, which didn't exist 15 years ago. Um, you're getting these new boxes. 
Uh, I put Razer down there because they bought Ouya. I have no idea what they're doing with that. But Apple TV, PlayStation TV, Fire TV, we've got the Fire TV guys here. Um, the, and I think that might be a sinister you know, backdrop to the whole Amazon free, 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 free game. Maybe they'll buy a Fire TV. Um, the console installed console install base is as big as it's ever going to get. Um, we are seeing people moving away from console. Uh, you are getting a different kind of console gamer. Um, and uh, let's just jump to the bottom there. Uh, Non-traditional gamers are what drove the last cycle. And, and I'm picking on women here, but Nintendo trained 25-year-old women. They, they saw a game like Guitar Hero and they wanted to play it, and the only way to play it was to have a console, so they bought a Wii. Um, 45-year-old women thought Wii Fit was cool, and so they bought a Wii. 65-year-old uh, women thought that Wii Bowling and Wii Tennis was a way to stay in shape, so they bought a Wii. Um, and then, of course, none of them bought a Wii U in this cycle, and they're not going to, because they moved on, they're playing tablet and mobile games. So Nintendo was probably the best thing that ever happened to expanding the base, and they talked about their Blue Ocean strategy, and it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, but it's over. It's uh, now that's been taken by everybody else, and I think that Sony and Microsoft have capitalized on roughly half of the Wii audience that are really console gamers and want to continue to play console games. So there were about 100 million Wii sold last cycle. About half of those, 50 million probably, are real core gamers that are going to buy something and continue to play console games. And I think Sony and Microsoft are splitting up that market. The other half, probably not, and they're probably moving on. Um, PS4 is impressive. And you know, if you think back, if you've been around long enough, uh, the PS1, the PS2 were giant consoles, giant install base, dominated. PS3, not so much. I don't think, I think the PS3 was like Mission Impossible 3, you know, it was just a really crappy movie. It didn't kill the franchise. Mission Impossible 4 and 5 were great. Um, I think Sony's back, just like Tom Cruise is back, you know, it's okay. You can have a bad movie every once in a while. Sony had a bad console and, and they got over it. Um, Xbox One, they blew it. A lot of DRM, they confused the hell out of people. Um, they, they wanted to make you buy Connect. You didn't want Connect. You didn't want to deal with DRM. They backtracked everything, cut the price, too late. Sony's brand is overwhelmingly stronger, gonna be stronger. So Sony's gonna win. Guess what? Second place is good. Microsoft's fine. Let's not cry. Shareholder of both, by the way. Um, so we're gonna have a good cycle. This is gonna be good. But the point is that the next generation is not gonna be bigger than the last generation. We're gonna be about the same. The Wii U's gonna sell 20 million units compared to 100 for the Wii. Uh, the PS4 will sell 120, 130 million, that's great. Xbox One will sell 100 to 110, that's great. Add that up, it's 260, maybe. And the last cycle was 270. So we're not gonna be bigger, yet we all know there's a lot more people playing games. So what do we do? I think we're gonna see 260. I don't see an advance in technology. I think 4K, 8K TV is great, except there's nothing to watch on a 4K TV. Um, if you have a 4K TV, you either have one because the price differential wasn't that great from 4K to the 1080p you were thinking about buying, or because you're a moron, okay? There is nothing, no, there's, there's nothing to watch. And people, you know, I gotta say, seriously, every single television show produced in the US, every single one is shot in 4K, all of them. Anybody wanna guess how many television shows over the air are broadcast in 4K? Zero, right, zero. So there is no content. If you buy a Blu-ray disc of a movie made after 2014, I think, that's in 4K. You can watch that in 4K. Why the hell would you buy a 4K TV? So people talk about this, this we had this talk about 3D TV a few years ago, smart TV a few years ago is gonna change the universe. No, it's not. Um, you're not gonna get a 4K broadcast standard till 2020 at the earliest. Maybe that's about the, next, the timing for the next cycle, but honestly, the only reason you're gonna buy a 4K TV is that that Samsung 60 inch 4K TV will be under a thousand bucks this holiday. And next year, 800 bucks, and the next year, 600 bucks. And you'll buy it just because, just like my last TV is LED, I didn't want an LED TV. I have a dent built into my wall for the TV that's five inches deep, but 
You can't buy an LCT, LCD TV anymore. Everything is LED. That's what's going to happen with 4K. There won't be a real upgrade cycle for consoles, no real reason to buy them. What we're going to get is a lot of model updates. We've already seen a new model, you know, the one terabyte um, hard drive on the consoles. We had seven Xbox 360s, 12 PS3s. You're going to get that many Xbox One PS4. But I honestly think where it's going is you're going to get the boxes designed to, to deliver over the top television. That's what OTT TV is, um, where you get your television through the internet and you're hearing all these Sling TV, HBO Now. You know, everybody's doing it. There's going to be more and more and more of that, and PlayStation uh, TV does that as well. So why is this the last cycle? And this is the punchline. So just in case you were taking notes when Martin got up this morning, he said you're going to have one takeaway from every presentation. This is the takeaway. This is the last real console cycle. I don't mean that Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo will shut down and go bankrupt. They will not. Each of them will make another console. Some people will buy them. And the next console cycle will be to this console cycle, similar to the 3DS cycle to the DS cycle. So 3DS is selling about 13 million units a year. DS had five consecutive years that sold more than 26 million. So about half as big. The next console cycle will be half as big. So when I say the last cycle, the reason is console games shouldn't require a console. I am not talking about the cloud. If you think back to, and I'm just credit Nolan Bushnell because he's a nice guy. Think back to Atari. Atari was started out as a coin-op arcade machine game. What is an arcade machine? It's a monitor, a CPU-GPU combo, and a joystick. That's it. Control, display, CPU-GPU. What is a console? CPU-GPU, controller, and it connects to your television. Pretty easy, right? If you can get rid of the CPU-GPU, why do you need a console? You don't have to get rid of it as in eliminate it and shift it to the cloud. You have to get rid of it and put it in something that's already in your house which would be my iPhone 8 or 9, not this version, but it's coming, or my PC, or my Surface tablet, or my iPad Pro, whatever, whatever device comes out. Garnet in the back will tell you it's your Fire TV box. Of course, that's fine. It might be that. But you're going to have a CPU, GPU in your house that is connected to your television, either through Smart TV or Fire TV stick. And so I'm just going to make this up because I, I don't know this. But Amazon will be complicit in this because Amazon is going to dominate the planet. They're going to own the world. Okay? There will be one store in the universe that's going to be called Amazon. And what Amazon's going to do is they're going to give everybody a controller. They're going to give everybody a Fire TV box. They're going to hook up content and they're going to say, our box has a CPU, GPU. It's got enough storage so that you can download, I'll just say Call of Duty, because if you're going to pick Amazon, the charity, we might as well partner them with Activision, the greediest company on the planet. And I mean greedy, I mean greedy in a good shareholder friendly way. Activision understands who owns them and they want to maximize profit for their shareholders. They, and they know they have to do that by making great games. But what Activision is going to do, I think, I don't know any of this stuff. They're going to say, Call of Duty, what is, what is it? It's this client file, I don't know, 25, 30 gigabytes. And it's this multiplayer cool stuff. And so if we can make Call of Duty available through a Fire TV box that will be 49 bucks by then, and with a Fire TV controller, it'll be 30 or 40 bucks by then, we can bypass the console. And if we bypass the console, maybe we can capture a piece of that multiplayer revenue. You know, so when you think about multiplayer, and you know, back to Halo 5 and free DLC, why? Because multiplayer, Xbox Live, 60 bucks a year. They're 60 bucks a year, that's good. Who gets it? Not Activision. So they're not getting on Call of Duty. So what I think we're gonna probably do, if you go to the very last bullet on this slide, you're gonna have a company that's formed like National Cinemedia, and you probably don't know what that company is, but if you have ever watched a movie in a theater in the US, there are advertisements before the film. National Cinemedia delivers the advertisements. And what National Cinemedia is, is a consortium of the film exhibitors, the theater operators, and they pool 
um, for delivering these ads and selling these ads, and then they share the revenue based on whose theaters the ads are shown in and how many people see them. Imagine that for Multiplayer Gaming Inc. Imagine Activision, EA, Take-Two, Ubisoft form together and they say, all of our games can be played multiplayer for three bucks a month. Again, I'm making this up. And Amazon Web Services will gladly host that for 50 cents because, as I said, they're a charity. And it probably costs Amazon Web Services a penny to get 50, so they'll make a ton of money on it. So there's 250 left. If 40% of all gameplay is Call of Duty, again, I'm making it up, sounds good. Activision gets a dollar a month versus zero right now. If Activision says you can load, call, download Call of Duty to your phone or your tablet or your Surface or your PC and play multiplayer for three bucks a month, if you're the average consumer, you go, wait a minute, if I buy the hard, you know, the physical disc and I buy a console, I've got to pay $349 for an Xbox or $399 for PlayStation. I've got to pay five bucks a month for online multiplayer access. And yeah, I get a disc that I can trade back in for 20 bucks. But if I buy this, essentially it's a PC game, for 50 bucks, I save 10 right away and I save $2 a month on my multiplayer and I don't have to buy a console. So what happens? Lower the entry so no one needs a console. If, you, if Activision sells 20 million copies of Call of Duty, how many people would, that, that's the 20 million people who have a console. How many people would buy it who don't have a console? I'm guessing 20 million more. Let me make it easier for the Europeans in the room. How many people would play FIFA if a console wasn't required? Another 20 million. So if you're Activision, you're EA, you're like, we're gonna make more money. How many people play Grand Theft Auto if you didn't need a console? 100 million, it's just crazy numbers. So this makes so much sense, it is gonna happen. It's absolutely gonna happen. So what's it mean? You grow, your, you grow your addressable market. Instead of looking at 270 million as an upper limit as to how many games you can sell, you're looking at 1.4 billion if the phone or the tablet is powering it, two and a half billion if the PC is, is powering it. That's a lot of people. Um, I'm not talking cloud. I mean, cloud might happen, but latency still is a problem. Uh, I'm talking local client. This is gonna play like League of Legends, which is local client. Um, services, as I said, instead of paying the, the console manufacturers, the publishers are gonna get the money, which just means they're gonna make it first rate. It's gonna get great. Um, and as I said, Amazon Web is gonna power all of it. Consumers, you go beyond the console, the all-in cost of owning a game is lower. No console purchase, um, theoretically lower game, you know, packaged goods purchase, which probably will be a digital copy. And the consumer, I think you could actually drop the price of Call of Duty and FIFA to 30, 40 bucks, and the publishers are even in, in terms of their unit economics. Um, if you double the market, they're making a lot more money. So again, lower the price, you're gonna get higher volume. You get more people playing, you've got that whole back end that you're gonna have more people paying to play. Um, and as I said, the publishers need a hook, so I think they charge less than 50, 50 bucks a year, or 60 bucks a year. Uh, retailers, not so good. Um, you go beyond consoles, retailers probably don't stick around too long. Um, I think there will always be a market for physical goods. Uh, give you a good, good metric you didn't know. Uh, in 1997, and I picked 1997 because that was the year that Napster, Grokster, and Kazaa were invented. Um, music CD sales in the US were 1 billion, 10 million units, 10, 10. In 2014, music CD sales were 183 million. Now, that's kind of remarkable, not because it declined 82%, but because there were 183 million CDs sold in the US last year. Like, who the fuck bought them? I have no idea. But somebody bought them, right? Now, I, I, would say, I still buy CDs because, as gifts. Like, if somebody's at my house and they hear something they like, I will buy them the CD because it's fun for eight bucks or 10 bucks. But the, the fact is, physical media is really hard to get rid of. And as long as there's a profit to be made in physical media and somebody wants it, they will still be made. So the retailers will still exist. But I think they're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And you're going to get migration to full game downloads. Um, more important, I think all the growth in the industry is gonna be absorbed by full game downloads if you go off console, because you're gonna be hitting people. Again, there's plenty of 40 year old guys who would like to play FIFA or Call of Duty, but can't, for one game, they're not gonna buy a console. And you just know that. And I'd say that's true of every single game made. You're, there is a niche market, which is probably <laughs> several million people who would never buy a console to play the game, but they would absolutely buy the game because they hear it's great. Um, developers. Bigger addressable market 
means you sell more stuff. And that, I think what's really interesting here, um, I had a conversation with two prominent developers at the uh, Sony Expo, I think it was called, in last December. And they were, they were actually talking about re-upping their contract. And I, I went out to dinner with them and they asked me um, what I thought they should ask for. And I, I won't name the publisher because I don't want to get in too much trouble. But I said, ask for back end uh, on off console sales. Because I think this happens in three or four years. And these guys are going to sign a five year deal. Um, I think you're going to see this in 2018. And I think there's big money. So negotiate a royalty on a per unit basis because you're gonna get paid a lot. I think developers are gonna make a ton of money, which is good. Um, you guys create all the joy. You, you deserve to share in some of the profit. Um, I think that if the publishers control multiplayer, there's more money for the developers, and you should ask for some of that too. And uh, as you eliminate used games, you know, as you migrate to digital used games, get smaller and smaller as a piece of the total. You obviously reduce cannibalization of new game sales, and you really want every person who plays your game to pay for it, and pay, pay for it in a way that you can benefit. Oops, I'm not the, oh, did I go too fast? No, okay. Um, what else? You know, free to play games, you all know. Low barriers to entry, you know, 50,000 bucks, you can make Flappy Bird. You know, 500,000 bucks, you can make most decent mobile games, you spend a million bucks. It's hard to spend 20 million unless you're Zynga. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, well, I, I don't know. Somebody, uh, Alf had the presentation of Mountain Goat Mountain. Have you looked at that game? If that game costs more than 50,000 bucks, there's something wrong with the universe, but you know it did, but it shouldn't. You know, I, I mean, I don't, how many different kinds of goats can you design? I, there's probably only like three kinds of goats in the world. Um, yeah, and I, I actually don't buy that top 10 being 20% of revenues, because you know, if you look at the revenues in the top 10, it's gotta be 60, 70%. Not that many people are making money in, uh, in mobile. I'd say the top 100 are definitely 90%, though. It, it's, it's pretty concentrated among the successful games. Um, and I think the hard part on mobile is balance. I didn't know about, um, about Amazon Underground, so I didn't know that you were going to completely change the landscape, and I actually think that works. That is a brilliant model if you guys are committed to it and stick with it. Um, if you end up Making every game free, you can actually go back to just making games that are fun. You don't have to worry about balancing the economy because everything's free. Who cares? Um, people will play. And, and I, that's where Nintendo's library gets really interesting. I mean, you play every GBA game ever made on mobile. Nintendo doesn't want to do it because they can't turn it into a, a free-to-play model. You don't have to. That's cool. Um, for sure, phones and tablets have cannibalized handheld. That's why 3DS sales are half as big as DS. Um, tablets the new laptops, that's more interesting to me because, as I said, you don't need any kind of hardware in your house to play a console game. Um, in the cloud, I don't know. Uh, OnLive is kind of gone. I mean, Sony, Sony keeps you know, buying up all these Gaikais and OnLives. I have no idea what they're going to do. Um, I'm hopeful that Sony is rational about this and they recognize that they have to kind of ensure their own existence. But Sony is a hardware company, as a company. And so it's hard for them to get into the cloud service business. One would think Microsoft would have done that, and they did not. Um, so conclusions. I think this digital shift to full game downloads, to you know, everybody um, having an opportunity to play a game without having to invest 399 bucks is a huge opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity for everybody in the value chain except the retailer and maybe the console manufacturer. Um, I think that ultimately these, these shifting revenues supplement current revenue streams. I think you get more money, and that's great. Um, I think that as Nintendo has trained, uh, we used to talk about Nintendo dads about 10 years ago. We talked about these guys who you know, had an NES in 1985 when they were 10 years old, and you know, they were dads in 2005, and they were you know, open to their kids playing games. We now have these Candy Crush moms who, and, and I, you know, I'm sure she's not up at five in the morning, but my wife is, is that person. My wife thinks games are absolutely retarded. She cannot understand why anybody spends any time playing games, and she gets pissed at me when I play games. She doesn't understand why I need to play games, and I, you know, whatever, I, I, I have excuses. But she started playing Candy Crush, and she's on like, you know, level 600. And she's been playing it for three years. She's totally addicted to it, spends money, and she's suddenly completely tolerant of my kids playing games because she does it. It's guilty, pleasure, but she does it. 
I think that's a bigger deal than the 10 dads because your dad never said no to anything. Your mom's the one who was the pain in the butt. You know that. So if you get the mom on your side, oh my God. So the opportunity is amazing. And you know, I, also Kevin was talking about the nine-year-old kid trash talking. And your first question should be, what nine-year-old is allowed to play Halo? And the answer is all of them. You know, so that, I mean, that's like, it didn't happen 20 years ago, but it's happening now. Um, you know, publishers have to embrace these new business models. So, so DLC is a big deal. The, the idea that Microsoft would give it away for free, it's unbelievable. It's mind blowing. Um, but like I said, new ways to monetize, we've heard this, more frequent updates, just keep people engaged. I mean, the ultimate goal is keep the player engaged and you'll figure out how to make money off of that. Either Amazon's gonna pay you or games as a service, it doesn't matter. There's a way to keep that player coming back. He will buy more of your stuff in the future. Um, and I think that free to play can be on any platform. That's something I think that a lot of people miss. They think it's mobile only. And again, we have Wargaming guys here. You know, we've got Kabam guys here. We've got Riot Games guys here. There's a lot of opportunity on PC. And when that PC becomes the, the vehicle that gets a console game on the TV, that's where I think we've come full circle back to PC. Um, consumer choice and consumer demand is what's driving all this growth. Uh, casual and social is what trains people to play games. Uh, the negatives, I think, it's hard to succeed in any of these businesses and the more you democratize it, it's gonna be harder for the established to, to stay established. Um, the, I guess the barrier though there is the graphics on console games are so expensive to produce that you're gonna still have some rich big guys. And it, I think the, the biggest negative is free to play is free. Um, again, we talked about the 95% of people who don't pay. That's a problem. You know, you're creating a lot, of, a lot of joy and not monetizing it. That's why I think this Amazon Underground is so fascinating, I mean, if it works. It's a great model, it's just that you need deep pocket Amazon to fund it and, and there has to be a benefit to Amazon or they won't keep doing it. So ultimately, um, you really do wanna monetize those people playing your games. So I think about 10 years, we just aren't gonna care about consoles anymore. We're gonna be talking about consoles the same way we talk about the Wii U right now. Um, I don't think smart TVs are gonna be necessary. I think devices get connected through things like Apple TV, Fire TV, Chromecast. Um, and I think smart TVs, you can't buy a new TV now that's over 40 inches that's not smart. So it'll be built into every TV, but you won't have a TV in every room that's connected. The Fire TV sticks, 35 bucks. What the hell, Chromecast is 35 bucks. You're gonna retrofit fit every TV, and if you have a reason to do that, piece of cake. Storage is less essential if we can ever get the cloud to work, I don't think so, um, or consumers are willing to embrace it. If, it. if it's a bad experience, they won't but I think that storage is less of a problem when you get your iPhone 9 and it has 512 gigabytes in it. And the phone I just held up has 128 gigs. I have no idea why I bought it. I just got tired of not being able to update iOS on my last phone, so I bought it for about 128. I'll buy 512. Um, Package goods drop about 10% a year, but they're gonna stay around. I'd say they probably level off about 50% at current level. Um, gamer demographic keeps getting bigger, and that's mostly because we age. So uh, I, who will be 60 in January, God, I can't believe how old I am, am the oldest guy alive playing games, and I will still be playing games when I'm 80, as long as I'm still alive. Uh, and there's always a new generation of nine-year-old Halo players who trash talk, so they're just not going away. Uh, Minecraft is training those guys, so it's, it's gonna keep going. Traditional gamers are gonna have high standards, non-traditional low standards. I think the traditional gamer market with high standards does broaden, but the only way you actually see a step function change in that is to pull the console out of the equation. Make that open to people who can't afford a console or don't, don't wanna afford a console. Um, smart devices, I'm really curious, and I know Rich Hillman talked about this a few years ago, about you know, having a different experience on different devices, and I, I, that actually resonates with me. Um, but smart, the smarter the device, the the closer the experience will be. And the experiences have to be complementary. And you know, EA is kind of the poster child for that with trying to get you to play FIFA on different devices in different settings. And it's not the same game, obviously, but keeping you engaged, and I think that's really smart. Um, packaged goods will be around. Used games will be around as long as packaged goods are around. Full game downloads will be available on, you know, on demand to any device in a few years. 
Um, I think that you're gonna see a migration to this games sold in installments, and I'm talking about Destiny. Um, Destiny is not a conventional package game. It's not a conventional you know, launch in fall of 14 and then it's done and you have some DLC. This most recent DLC update coming out Tuesday is gigantic and it's one of those things that Activision is counting on this and I think it's fair. Every single DAU on Destiny is buying it. Every one of those guys. It might be three and a half million but they're all buying it and probably half of the MAUs that are, that are around are going to buy it in the first few weeks. Um, that's kind of unprecedented and they're going to do this again next year and again the next year until there's a Destiny 2. So keeping players engaged and monetizing that engagement is what Activision is all about. So again, I mean this with utmost respect. They are greedy in a good sense because they are giving players a great experience and a great perceived value for the $40 that they're going to spend on this expansion pack and people want it and they're going to pay for it, which is great. That's, that's perfect economy. If you can sell somebody something and they feel like they got a bargain and that is destiny. Um, microtransactions, again, Alf's killing my presentation here because you won't need them if, if everything's free. Um, but I, I don't know, I want to see how that works. You know, you're not on iOS, I understand why. Um, iOS is still a, a very strong platform for mobile, so we'll see how that works. And I think ultimately you might get true games as a service with subscriptions. Um, every game is going to have a digital or mobile component. So again, I think you can do complementary design so that you can keep people engaged all the time. And for that, I'm talking Fallout. Like Fallout Shelter is not Fallout. But if you're a Fallout player, I'm pretty sure you downloaded Fallout Shelter and noodled around with it for an hour or so. Just you did and it kept you engaged and it's fun and it gets you psyched to buy Fallout 4. You're gonna start seeing a lot more of that, I think. Um, you might see a bold company split single player and multiplayer into two different games. And I think GTA is the poster child for that. They didn't do that and they actually should have. I think if GTA, the package good, was sold independently from GTA Online, you still would have had 50 million people buying GTA and you would have had 300 million people playing GTA Online. So I think there's an opportunity there if you see guys starting to split it. Um, and again, I think it would be great if you could play on multiple devices and watch your game progress. You can do that with Hearthstone. Uh, you can do that with Candy Crush, but for what, some reason you can't do it. You can't play Call of Duty cross-platform except now Xbox One and, uh, and you can play Microsoft proprietary Xbox One and PC. Um, the audiences that keep growing, I already talked about Candy Crush Moms. Uh, I think that you might start seeing more advertising to monetize that 95%. And again, maybe the ad is no ad, you know, ad-free Amazon Underground and they're paying. Um, my predictions, Microsoft loses, but they still win because they finish a very strong second and they make a ton of money, which is winning is making money. That's okay. Um, Sony absolutely thrives. They get back to their prominence and they, they deserve it. They've done great. Nintendo continues to make amazing software, but I don't think they get it. Um, I do think this mobile move by Nintendo is a, is a positive sign. I hope that they succeed. I think if they embrace something like Amazon Underground, uh, Nintendo could be the biggest player by a large measure on, on mobile, but we'll see if they do. Nobody's going out of business. All the weak companies are gone. Uh, you might see some consolidation. There's still one or two companies out there that, that have great IP that could be bought. Um, the PC is coming back, but you might not have a PC in a few years. It might be your phone. And imagine your phone, you know, with some eight gigahertz microprocessor and a fast GPU card sitting in a docking station in your house and talking to all your TVs. Like, why not? We can do that.